Hey. 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 You know how it's been done? With adjustments of your lifestyle. Now, my darling wife, my bride, of 57 years next month, the only way we survived 57 years of marriage is that we made adjustments. <laughs> A lot of them. And you make those adjustments. And so, speaking of adjustments, that's where Mother Reese Cole comes in, a traveler with Elvis Presley. You can see he's dressed, I'm just a commoner. But he traveled the world with Elvis Presley. Uh, he's quite a star in his own right, he's quite a pianist. And we've kind of linked up. And here comes Priscilla. And I just want to give her a shout out too. Two weeks ago, she took over the class for Cindy and she did a phenomenal job. She really did. So There's some seats here. These support groups are phenomenal. They're just terrific. Uh, those of you that know us and have been with us have benefited from coming, and you're still coming. And it's, it's kind of a free, you know, a choice thing. You do it voluntarily-wise. You come on your own. We come on our own. But I'm glad to be here with Maurice today. Uh, we've been hanging out together doing uh, presentations at rehab centers speaking to other amputees. He's a bilateral amputee. He's covered up his legs today. He's going to show his beautiful legs. But he's got two pretty legs. There's but one there's one of them. The other one almost matches. Yeah, it's it's, 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 except it's for the other foot. Yeah, it's left. Yeah, it's left now, yeah, that's very We important. did a presentation at Bilas, Arizona here a year ago. And we're going back this year on the 19th to do a presentation for diabetes. And he's now the keynote speaker. Oh, that's great. Isn't that great? Yes. And so all those Native Americans out there, four out of five of them have, have sugar. Three out of five Americans across the board. Not to talk about the nurses here, the, those that are pre-diabetic. Two of my presentations. How many, how many are diabetic here? <laughs> how, many, how many diabetics do we have here today? Yeah. Several. Yeah. Several, OK. Or near. So anyway, without further ado, let me just turn it over to Mo, and you can go. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and joining us, and uh, as again, and reiterate what uh, Mr. Cicero said uh, Tony, about, Tony, uh, Tony, uh, for you. about um, Cindy and her husband and, and the staff here. Um, without them, we wouldn't be here, obviously, without the Lord putting all of us together, none of us. But, uh, um, you know, diabetes is a very, very serious situation. I mean, it's, you know, we cut up and everything, and I make fun of myself all the time. Because in order to get through life, you've got to be as positive as you can. And uh, if you have uh, your resources taken away from you, as I did, um, you got to stay as positive, man. So, it's kind of fun making jokes about me, so I'm, I beat you to punch, you know, on that. But I, I've got to tell you, diabetes has gotten to an epidemic position in this country. We have 29.7 million diabetics. We have 87.1, uh, uh, excuse me, 287.1 million people that are pre-diabetic. So that's just about everybody one way or the other, you know. Um, <clears throat> diabetes uh, 2 is what I have. I got it when I was 45 and I'm 60 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll be 70, uh, God will, on the 5th day of February. And uh, uh, it you know, you hear people say, well, everybody in our family's got it. Well, it's because they didn't do what they were supposed to. It's not an inherited uh, trait that we have. And I thought it was myself, but it isn't. Um, diabetes 1, of course, and, and juvenile diabetes is very, very, very difficult. Well, what I have and what anybody else has is diabetes 2, if you take care of yourself, you can reverse it. You can totally get rid of it. I do not take care of myself. I'll 
briefly go, um, I don't know how many of you all have seen us speak, and I apologize if I don't remember you, but uh, after a while, like I said, they all look alike, you know, and, and a lot of times from performing, I would maybe be looking straight at this lady and never see her. I don't mean to be offensive, but I, I would have yes, my mind does. on yes, it. Yes, he does. I'd have my mind on what I'm doing, and so I apologize to you. Uh, it's a blessing because we all are brothers and sisters, and you know how we are with our brothers and sisters. Um, so I, in my earlier years, I worked with a lot of different stars. Yes, I did perform with Elvis Presley, but um, I performed with many, many others. It happens to be a name that most of us from the age of 10 to on up knows who it is. Well, in those days, uh, I was young, and crazy. Foolish. And foolish. Go ahead. That's why I help you. I was young and, and crazy acting and everything, and I, to be very frank with you, I drank a lot. Um, I followed the ladies around a whole lot because I couldn't catch them all. <laughs> and, uh, and I was single then, too. And I uh, got involved with some drugs. You know, you go to a party and there's coke or heroin or whatever. And uh, like I was just telling him, I, I just took some oxycontin a while ago, but it wasn't because I wanted to get high. It was because of my, my I don't know, I've done something like that, which is a minor thing. And once I whip him around, little bit it'll go away but I uh, I really got hooked on a lot of things and I ate like a horse and hog or a couple of goats and uh, it was, you know, I thought it was cool you know young people and, uh, and you're uh, you're something so you think in your own mind but you're not you're no different than any person in this room. We all have jobs. You could be a you could be a physician, you could be a truck driver, you could be an attorney, you could be a waitress, or a musician, or a football player, or a baseball player. We're all the same. We all believe the same. We all came into this world the same, and we're all gonna leave this world the same. Now it may be on a different variation of it, but we're all gonna die. Uh, if you get a serious diabetic situation, it will kill you. you know, <coughs> it's taken me a little at a time. It took, it took a toll, and I was just getting ready to do a concert in uh, Detroit, <clears throat> in Ford Field. And my wife was with me, you know, and we were in the hotel getting ready to go over and do the show. And I said to her, I had taken a bath, and uh, I said, wow, look at my toe, what toe, my big, what big toe. And it looked like a, it happened so fast that I didn't even know what was going on. It looked like a, a brat that somebody had overcooked, and burnt it, you know, crispy or unsexy. And you know how a brat or a hot dog or whatever will split or cook too much. This thing was black as, as her, that is black, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't tell blue and black, but I... Neither can I. But, <laughs> He's uh, black, but, it's okay. but I saw her blue back there, and it's a little bit lighter than my blue is, but her black's darker. You know? Well, anyway, I said to Gloria, I said, this thing was black, and I touched it, and it was kind of crunchy feeling, and it, and it, and it, and it was oozing out. Stuff. I said, oh my God, I said, what is happening to my foot? And she said, oh my God, you prepared. My wife is, uh, uh, was a physical therapist, and our daughter's a nurse, and our son in law is a physician, and we've got two grandchildren in the med school. I'm the only outcast, I'm the piano player. So I said, well, what are we going to do? And she says, well, we're going to call back home and see what they say. We called the doctor and they said, Give me Maxine Lewis now. 
And I told Gloria, I said, well, tell him I got to a concert. They said, well, if you do, you're not going to be living to do another one. Uh, so they kind of changed my mind about staying. So the rest of them went on without me, and we went home. On the way, we stopped at Ann Arbor to kind of uh, settle me down with whatever they had to do to get me so I could get back home. As soon as I got into the St. Louis area, we called and said, we're like 15 minutes from the hospital. I come straight from the hospital. We went there, and they were waiting for me at the emergency entrance and took me straight into surgery. Well, that was the beginning of what we're up to right now. You see, that was the beginning of a lot of things up to right now. Change and adjustment. Go ahead. I had gotten off of the alcohol. I had gotten off of the drugs. And everything. But still, I was drinking a little here and there. You know, I used to float a nice sized bass boat with how much I drank. But so they did the operation. And that was the early part of 2002. They did about another seven operations on that foot. They took all the rest of the toes. And I told them to take them all in the first place. They said, no, we can't do that. you to try to save them. And I figured, well, they just needed more money to add on another room in their house or something. <laughs> so they'd do a toe or two at a time and so on. Well, anyway, they went all the way back just below where the uh, shin is here. They says, now if we have to go any further, uh, we're going to take the leg. Well, um, I hobbled around for a while with that. And finally, sure enough, they had to take the leg. And I thought, well, that's OK. I can drive and everything, you know. And I can walk around pretty good once I get to walk and everything. But what really messed me up was I was also a concert organist. I had went out on my own and pulled away from everybody else. I was doing theater concerts across, well, actually, from Australia to South Africa, all the way around and around the United States. <clears throat> so they cut the leg off, and uh, three months later, I had a new leg. Well, I'm learning how to get around pretty good. So uh, I didn't drink at all. Except occasional glass of wine or something with a meal with guests. But I didn't stop eating like with that horse that I spoke of earlier. I didn't stop sweets. Big no no. Big, big no no. So the right leg starts giving me troubles. Same situation, same scenario. And uh, last year, Antonio tell you, I was in Banner Baywood all but six weeks, and I wasn't visiting. I was a resident, you know. I mean, I could, I could tell you right now everything on that menu that they've got. And so they did 11 operations on me last year, trying to save the right way. And finally, they had to take it off. Now, that's where we are right now. I lost, when I lost that leg, you don't know how much I lost. I lost the ability, I can't drive. I don't, you'll see I got a cane, I got a walker, and I got a scooter. So uh, I, I, get, I get around, I'm mobile. I'm very positive. I, I, I will not accept you can't. That doesn't compute in my head. Uh, I always say, you can do anything you want to do. The impossible takes just a little bit longer. And no matter what you say, you're right. If I say, Lydia, I want you to climb that wall and go up on the roof and come back down through a, a pipe out there. And she says, well, I can't do that. She's right. She said, I can't do that. She's right. But. Lydia say, okay, let's see, you know, let's figure out how we're going to do this. She's saying, I can do it. She's right. And there's more people will say, I can't do it, than the ones that says, I can. Now, I'm 
I'm going to bypass a whole bunch of stuff that was told to me. Like everybody told me when I lost this leg, I was 65. They said, you'll never walk again. The day I put the leg on, I walked. And I amazed people because here's this bad old man that took off walking. Well, over here at Mikasa um, Rehab Center, after they took this leg off, I was there for about three months and they brought me these new legs and they put them on and they says, uh, can you stand here for a while? I said, sure, I'll stand here for a while. I mean, walk? Do you think you can? Well, of course I can. But he's no Blade Runner. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a Blade Runner. But I'm not, you can probably have two feet of them because I'm not a runner, you know. Um, so I walked back and forth with these, uh, rails, you know, that you hold on to. And it wasn't easy. And I got pictures in my phone of me doing what, exactly what I'm talking about in over here. And it wasn't easy. And it hurt. You know. And physically it hurt. But I, I went back and forth about three times and there was two or three therapists right there with me. And I said, okay, let's go. And they said, hey, are you tired? you want to go back to your room? I said, no, I want to go for a walk down the hall. And he says, you can't do that. I said, why? He says, well, we, we've never seen people do anything like that. And that was in November of, I mean, uh, you know, it was about January of this year, latter part of January. We take off and we go out of the physical therapy room out in the hall. And uh, of course I had one of them hold on me on one side, one on the other, but they weren't holding tight. I said, don't, don't hold on me tight, you know. And I knew I was gonna need help, and I was walking with a walker. And uh, we came back. Well then by that time I was very, very tired, no matter why. But I did it, you see. And I was told that I couldn't walk. People kept telling me, even the doctors said, now Mr. Cole, if you make it through the operation, and that's another thing we're going to talk about, uh, you won't walk again. You'll be in a wheelchair. I said, no, I'll walk. Well, we uh, got out of there, and here's where we're at now, you know. They said, uh, you know, you got about 30% chance of survival. I told my wife I probably wouldn't make it through the operation. Well, we here. We surprised them again. <laughs> you know where the health came from, don't you? Yep. Where the health came from. So God. Bet you. The Lord got me through it. But a funny part of this story is, I said, now I'm not going to come back to this room. I finally got a nice room where I could see out the windows. At Banner Bay, where they got some kind of deal with a uh, neighborhood, that if you can see a house, they got to fix the blinds when you can't see out, except if you go up and you just kind of look down. Because somebody thought people were in the hospital were spying on them or something. So, <laughs> I, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's just what I want to do is look at some woman in the bedroom and I'm trying to save a leg. You know? <laughs> so I said, and they finally got me this nice room that I could see out the windows and I could see the and I said, uh, are you going to bring me back here? And they said, oh yeah. Well, it was adjacent to IC. Unit, and uh, I figured, well, you know, I'm right there. So if they need to do something, they can come get me. So uh, we all agreed. And I think you like just to get me through the thing. So I wake up after the operation. And I wasn't in that room. They put me in a room that was stark white, all the way around. <laughs> Everything was white, and I'm looking around. Oh, man. Thought you were in heaven. <laughs> 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 I did. You know, this must be heaven. Well, I'm looking for a cloud float for about to get on. Mm -hmm. Well, about that time, here comes a nurse in the door. Check on. And I said, uh, and just like they do down there. 
and uh, I'm still, I still think I'm in heaven or something, you know, so I said, uh, can I explore where I'm at? And I shouldn't have done that, I think that kind of throws them off, and she said, yes, you're in Banner Baywood Hospital. I'm, oh, man, I'm still alive, <laughs> you know. So, that brings us up to why we're all sitting here now. I'm talking to you and telling you a story. I went through all this, all these rehab things and a great deal of pain. And that's something else you want to do. You want to be, you're going to be a diabetic, be prepared for some of the worst pain you've ever experienced in your life. Bar none. But you don't know what's going to happen because you can eat a cake or, or a bag of potato chips or drink a bottle of uh, Crown Royal or whatever it might be. Feels good, tastes good, doesn't hurt. So he doesn't know what he's talking about. And I've done it, you know. I just kind of put it out of my mind. When I, uh, uh, before they took this leg off, I passed out. And I thought it was a friend of mine. You ever have somebody come up behind you and put their knee behind between your knee or whatever it is? Boy, I mean, you just go down. Well, I passed out. And you know, I had to make me to the hospital. And doctor said, I'll stake my license, you're diabetic. Well, I, I didn't I felt fine after that. It didn't hurt, you know. Went home, had a big dinner, uh, and ate, ate potatoes and corn and all kinds of goodies and had some pie. And didn't hurt. So they said, uh, we're going to start having you check your sugar. You know? I said, okay, because uh, I think it was over 300 that day. And uh, that's not real good. And so, I just kind of put it aside, you know. Uh, be sure to check with your doctor now, frequent. Well, I'm gone. I'm on the road all the time. Uh, I never thought about it. And when you finish the program, generally the promoter would take you out to dinner if you're a real big, healthy crowd. If you didn't, they run you off and you go eat by yourself somewhere. But um, I just kept letting it go and letting it go and letting it go and everything started happening. Well, right now my vision is not as good as it was. And they call it the silent killer. There's a reason why they call it. Because at first you don't hurt, you know. You're not, you're not shaky. You're not wobbly or anything. Uh, your eyes feel good, your feet feel good. And normally when it starts, it goes to the furthest extremity from the heart. So it usually goes to the toes and feet. And uh, it, uh, after a while, you start getting, does anybody here have neuropathy or know what that is? How many people know what neuropathy is? Uh, it starts out as a tingling, you know. Like, now I know how my, I got a little miniature docks and I know what it's shot, I know what it feels like, because it tingles kind of like that, you know when you are. Well, that tingle, as time goes along, and you keep the sugar level way up there, gets to be more and more and more pain. Very, very, very bad. And it gets to the point of pain that you'll call the doctor, and I did, and say, please cut my leg off. You know, please cut my leg off. And I don't want to, I don't want anyone of you all in here. Do we have anybody with any, any kind of an artificial limb here today? No artificial limb? Fake hip. Oh, no, that don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I knew he's got a hit. But you're feeling a lot better since you got a new one, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. God got, bless you. Got rid of the pain. Uh, so does Miss Lydia. She has one. And um, I got fake feet, but uh, you know, they come along with the legs. So I'm okay. <laughs> Did you, are you going to tell about your uh, epiphany? 
before you to tell uh, on Jessica. We have Q and A somewhere here. We want them to well, kind yeah. of react and ask you some questions because you've gone through a big adjustment. But I want to just interject. The adjustment is not just for Mo. The adjustment is also for Gloria, his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't want to forget about that. I mean, she's been with him 39 years, almost 40. We're going to give her a medal next year. But anyway, uh, that's she deserves one, right? You agree with that? Yeah. And she's his caretaker now. And his chauffeur, and his cook, and his everything. So that's a big adjustment. That everything is the best part of the whole shoot. Okay. <laughs> she would agree. Well, um, did you record what I was saying so that we could run the tape back and I can finish? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Anyway, I was, I didn't know why I was still living, you know, uh, and there's, if you've seen me before, you've heard this story, but I won't quit sharing it until the Lord calls me home, because I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, what, what am I going to, even though I'm my age, playing was my life, my livelihood, my fun. I even told my wife when we got married, for, when she met me, I was doing an uh, opening act for, uh, I think it was Engelbert Humperdinker, this is going to sound stupid, but I was working with him and opening up for him, and Roy Rogers and Dale Evans in one year, a lot. So I forgot, but anyway, we were working at Indiana State Fair, and she was an Indiana State Police person. And uh, I got to get that straight because she carried a gun. And um, her and another lady, that what they do, what the police do, is uh, we have dressing rooms in, 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 in the form of campers, RVs, <laughs> that they put out there for us to stay in. And then they will have, depending upon who you are and how big you are, uh, either two people or an entourage of security to take you up to the stage. And uh, <coughs> like a Engelberg would have, Burke would have uh, six, eight people around. I had two. That's okay. I, you know, I didn't even request them. I was just blessed that I had them. Well, the two I had, I mean, one of them was a fine looking blonde, and the other one was a beautiful redhead. I mean, wow, you know, and I'm thinking, uh, hmm, I wouldn't mind going out with one of these gals, but the redhead just kept kind of coming back to me. Well, then I got to thinking, you know, I went up and I was performing, and I got done performing, and I go back down there, they arc the stage entrance, and they walk me back to my dressing room until we would get two shows. Well, um, I chose the red, or the red hat chose me, whichever. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, then I got to thinking, I'm not sure I can do it with her, but I got to leave like 5 o'clock in the morning to catch a flight to go to Chicago. And I'm thinking also, she's got a weapon and I don't. You know, so you better be good about how you're going to figure out how you're going to ask her to go out, you know. And she said, hey, you want to go have a drink or something? I, I said, uh, you know, I don't get to see too many people or whatever when you tour like I do because I was doing 265 one-nighters a year. So that, you know, you're here, you're on a plane, and you're somewhere else tomorrow. Well, I said to her, I said, listen, I says, I don't mean to be forward, but I really did. <laughs> I said, would you like to go out and have uh, some dinner or a cup of coffee or a cocktail or something? And she says, I'd love to. And I can't remember what her, what her friend's name was, the other policeman. And she said, yeah, we like that very much. I said, okay. You know, I, 
uh, she's got her bodyguard with her, that's fine. At least I get to visit her. Well, that was 39 years ago. I courted her for about six months or seven. And uh, of course, I'm from Tennessee, so we, we didn't date, we courted her. And anyway, uh, I uh, asked her to marry me, and how that happened was we were, she came come down to visit me and my parents and she had three children and she brought them down. And I had never had children or anything, had a lot of dogs, but I never had real life kids. And so I was on March, or no, February the 27th of 1975, I said, Saturday morning when we were all sitting drinking home and I said, uh, Gloria, I've got a question to ask you. She says, what? I says, mind, how'd you like to get married? I don't know what to say. And she says, are you kidding? I said, no, I'm serious. She says, yes. So that was on a Saturday morning. Now, Monday, I had to leave to go to Sydney, Australia, and I was going to be on a six-week tour of that part of the world down there. So I'm thinking, I don't want to wait that long for her to, for me to come back. You know? And I'm thinking, uh, how am I going to do this? And I says, she says, when do you want to get there? And I says, sometime today. And she says, are you kidding me? Said, no. So I'm thinking, boy, I'm going to go through a lot, pull some strings here to get this fixed up. So I call my doctor and I said, his name is Dr. Bach, B-H-A-T, it's from India, but I used to call him Dr. Rad all the time, but I couldn't think of Bach, you know. And, uh, is it time for dinner? <laughs> I apologize, I don't know why that's doing that. Oh, that's cute, I like that. It's time for dinner, really quick, but go ahead and finish your story. Plenty dark yet. <laughs> so, this is a good part of the story. I know. This is, this is about, about love and everything. Right, right. So I called the doctor and I told him the same thing. I said, we're well, going to get married. And I said, can we get us a blood test? He said, sure. When do you want to do it? And I says, oh, let's see, it's about 9.30. I says, how about, say, 10 o'clock? He said, when? And I says, today. <laughs> he said, are you kidding? Same thing. I said, no. So you meet me at the hospital. So we go over to the hospital, a county hospital, a county we were in Tennessee. And, uh, Got our blood tests. In the meantime, I'm thinking, well, I can't get a hold of the pastor right now, so besides that, he can't give me a marriage license. Well, I had a good friend of mine, happened to be the circuit court judge, and I called him and I said, hey, what are you doing? He's playing golf. I said, right now? He says, yeah. He says, what you need? And I said, well, I need to ask a big favor of you. He said, what is that? I says, I want to get married. He said, well, congratulations, Dr. And uh, he said, when do you want to get married? And I says, how about noon? <laughs> and he says, today? And I says, yeah. He said, are you kidding me? I says, no. I says, really, well, I called you. I'm not being smart. I says, but you can get in the courthouse and get us a marriage certificate. I said, I already got a blood test for us. Okay, we'll do it. <laughs> so now we got him lined up. We're a little town where we lived at the county seat was like nine miles away and it was the old fashioned county seats that here's this courthouse in the middle of the town is in the square. You know. So we go over and get some uh, rings. All of a sudden I said, Oh no, she says, What's wrong? I said, I don't have a best man and we don't have a what do you call those things for late? Huh? <coughs> and she says well, you can stop and think about it. You can stop and think about it and uh, maybe find somebody. I said, well, I'll do the best I can. So we went over to the bank. Yeah, we went over to the bank. And the guy that was vice president, a friend of mine, he was also, he uh, lent a lot of money to musicians to buy instruments and everything. And I said, Tom, I said, well, let me ask you a question. He says, what? I says, uh, I introduced him to Glory D. Oh, I says, we'd like to get married. And I said, I need your help. I said, would you be kind enough to be my best man? He says, 
Well, you know I would. And he gives that smile like a Cheshire cat. And uh, he says, what are you going to do it, buddy? I says, well, you know, I'm going to go to Australia Monday morning. I says, uh, I plan on doing it today about noon. He says, today? And I, he looks at his watch. Now it's getting pretty close. You know, it's after 11 o'clock. And he says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll just take my lunch hour and go over with it. It's right across the street. So now i got a best man, but I don't have a lady. Hey, <laughs> and, and so I had a friend of mine that owned a, 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 a furniture store just right down the street. His name was Cyril Anderson. Couldn't think of it. I said, hey, Cyril. I said, uh, I need to ask you a question. He said, what? I said, uh, told him what we were doing. I didn't do that. I said, guess what I need? He says, what? I says, I need a maid of honor. And I gotta have one right now. You gotta go over to the courthouse. And he says, uh, well, well, let me think. I says, well, let me think. I says, would you be the maid of honor for us? And this guy married and got kids and everything. He says, me? I says, yeah. I said, all you gotta do is stand up for Gloria. And I says, that's all you gotta do. And uh, sure, I'll do it. So. Somebody heard us talking, and we all head over to the courthouse. Well, they got a little old, little bitty old newspaper, and they call people that own this. He did all the typeset and everything. His wife did the pictures, and she was the the reporter. They decided to come down and take pictures of us getting married. Well, they didn't know that the banker and the the furniture guy are going to be involved in the wedding, especially Sarah being old maid of honor. And the uh, wedding went off pretty good, except I said, I do to everything. No matter what he could say, I said, and finally the judge says, shut up. <laughs> he says, if I point to you, then you say I do, or I'll tell you to say I will, but otherwise don't say another word. <laughs> so we had the wedding, and Monday morning I left to go to Australia, and she and the children went back to Indiana on Sunday night. They said Monday afternoon the newspaper come out and a big picture of us on the front page. And here's this wedding party. And it's just concert organist weds Lady Cop and leaves the country. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my marriage and then March the first of next year I'll be a married forty years to this lovely wow. girl. And uh, so it's it, and she's she's went through not only me touring all the time and, and doing everything I did and, and uh, getting off of the alcohol and, and all the other things I was involved with, she was beside me all the way. Now, we're going to go right back up to when these two legs, then I'm going to get a little bit serious again, and then we're going to get out of here. I was sitting on the side of my bed on Christmas Eve of uh, last year, morning, or excuse me, yeah, Christmas Eve morning, it was about 8.30, and for some reason I didn't, you know how you get up and the first thing you do is you make a pot of coffee and turn on the TV to see what's up, well I haven't gotten a hold of the kitchen to bring me some coffee or anything, so I'm just sitting there. I'm just kind of thinking and wondering why I'm here and so forth. And I had nothing on, no TV, no radio. They didn't have the music on for some given reason this day out in the hall, you know. There was not a sound, not any sound. Uh, usually there's a people walking back and forth up and down the halls and nurses and all. And Anything. So I'm just kind of sitting here dangling like this, you know, like you from here up is where my legs really are. This voice came in. And it's not a voice in my head. It was an audible voice. Just like Rich said something to me right now. The voice said, I will let you live. But you will work for me. You will go and talk to people with losses of limbs. Ladies and gentlemen, I turned around. I looked. I looked 
just spoke to me and I heard the voice and it wasn't like the movie where Charleston Aston had the big deep voice and everything. It was just a gentle voice but firm. And I was told even after the operation that I would live a max of one to three months. Well, the operation anniversary for the first year is November the 20th, right down the road, right here, this month. Yeah. And that's how Tony and I got kind of hooked up together. Tony, the marvelous man, he, he takes me where I've got to go. And as I mentioned, he's a retired professor, and he is still today an evangelist. So. We were put together, and uh, I went to this church. I was invited to go to this church, and, and that's how I met him. He's the first person I met in that church, ironically. Okay. All these little pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together. But I don't know that so much, because I hadn't began to speak didn't know what I was going to speak about or who I was going to speak to. Well, I have, from anywhere from one to over a hundred. And being an entertainer, you usually got enough words that you can cover yourself anyway, you know. Okay. And of course, I won't talk much. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I go to this church. The first time I went there was it was in August of uh, year before last, and I walked in there and uh, it was about 110 outside. But when I went in that door, all of a sudden I and Gloria was with me and I, I said I looked around and I feel this really warmth, not hot, not from heat from outside or anything and kind of a glow in this round room, or kind of round. And I said, what in the world's that? She said, what? I said, what's that, what's that? Yellow looking glow around the room. She says, what yellow looking glow? And my wife sees quite well, and she's certainly not colorblind, as I am. But I could see that. I could see that it was a yellowish glow. And uh, it's warm. So anyway, we went into service and enjoyed the service. It was just great. Well, after the service was over, he comes over and introduces himself. And here's the puzzles just starting to click. So <laughs> we left there, and I said, you know, I wonder what that was. She said, I don't know. I said, and you know, I felt, I felt like somebody was wrapped around me or something, you know, and what the dickens is that? She says, at least I don't know, I didn't see no yellow ball, <laughs> you know, and okay, okay, I'm not gonna say no more, and because uh, she could hide my legs if she gets mad at me or something, you know, so <laughs> I, uh, we went home, two weeks later we went back to this church, by golly the same thing. I didn't say a whole lot about it because uh, it just happened. So the next morning, it's the Monday morning, I called the pastor of the church that I used to go to, Lutheran Church in Illinois. And I told him what happened. I said, This happened twice. And he says, Don't you know what that was? I said, Man, if everything is going on with me, I have no idea what it was, you know? And he says, That's the Spirit of the Lord. He had his arms around me. I said, you got to be kidding me. He says, and I love this guy. He, 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 was, you know, he used to crack up all the time. He says, no, 
I wouldn't care too about this. So, boy, I just couldn't believe it. And then people from this church come to visit me. You know, they took time day and evening and everything because I was in a hospital, like I say, for the most of the year. And still, Tony is right there. You know, he's either coming by to visit or he's calling me or whatever. I think he'd have probably sent a bird or two over too if he could have, <laughs> but he couldn't. But uh, point being is, I, we joined this particular church. It's called Church of Jesus Christ. It is not the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. It's a, it's a different church, but it's full of love. And that, that's as far as I'm going to go there. If you have any questions, we can answer those too. But what you need to do, the first thing one needs to do is you need to organize your eating habits. And I hate for somebody to say you got to go on a diet. Well, we're all on diets every day. No matter what we eat, it's, a, it's the diet that you eat. It's not the thing that you do, you know? So, well, I am going to tell you I'm going on a diet because we checked into this paleo. Has anybody ever heard of that diet? And the paleo diet is you can eat as much of um, greens and beef and all this that you want. It's a pro high protein diet. The bad news is everything you eat is good for you, but most of us don't like. You know, we don't like french fries or baked potatoes or mashed potatoes or corn or bread or biscuits or rolls. I'm going to go off the list. Oatmeal for breakfast. Rice. All those good things we just dearly love, you know. Deep fried onion rings. I mean, I could go on and on and on about the good stuff that you've got to drop. Brussels sprouts. Uh, what's those things that look like little clumps of grass? Uh, broccoli. Yeah. Uh, broccoli. Broccoli. Yeah. Broccoli. I figured if George Bush don't eat it, there's no reason why. I'm <laughs> so the object is is to eat the greens and, and stuff that are that really is good for you, and you stay away from carbs. Since, uh, okay. Well, the last ten minutes of the Q and A, you don't mind? Oh no, I don't. I know you wouldn't. And I'm setting it up for this. So. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so we sugars, you know, even the, you know, even the, we think uh, well, just because we don't eat sugar, I'll get some Splendera. I'll get some. What's the pink stuff? Green uh, wall, yeah. yeah. Or the blue stuff. Cool. That's not good for you either. Uh, it will it will play tricks with your sugar. You know? And the big thing is we want to keep our sugar levels low. And when I say if you were to have to stick yourself in a plane out like this, you need to be somewhere on the average of, uh, I'm starting to get into the medical end of it, and I don't want to do this because I'm not a medical person. But you need to keep it somewhere between 80 and 120, you know, in that, in that neighborhood. I did have to go down to 27 one time, and I about passed out, and I went into a diabetic uh, shock, and I would fall out of bed, and I was flung up around, and hit the walls, and, and had blood everywhere, and, my wife said it looked like a whale out of the water. I said, you could have said a fish. <laughs> so when the fire department got there, they knew exactly what it was. You don't know everyone get that low. Because people think it's because if you go up to 1,000, uh, you're going to go into a coma and die. You will, that's right. But if you go too low, you'll do the same thing. Um, but what I do is I cheat a little. I'll, I'll uh, go to the streets of uh, New York over here and have a piece of pizza. Of course, one piece is three sizes. And, or uh, 
once a month or so if I want to, I'll go I'll go get a I'll go to an Italian restaurant and have a plate of pasta. Because you can't the biggest problem with trying to lose weight and, and take care of yourself is we get gung ho and we take off after it, then it gets very boring. You know, it's like it's like a marriage if you don't do different things no matter what they are, because when you're young and in love, sex is the big thing. Well, you get older, you know what the dickens do you do? You know, <laughs> do you decide to play bingo or cards or whatever? So you've got to do things to to keep this thing going. So you treat yourself. And now they won't tell you that. They'll say, now you stay on this thing from now you die. Well, I still believe in a little treat every now and then, no matter what it is, you know. Your wife, you take her home uh, uh, something, a bouquet of flowers or something. Get something out of the ordinary that makes them feel really good, you know. Or they bring us something we like, you know. So you need to get with your doctor or the girls here. If you know, this is your doctor's, they, I can bring one of them in. They can go from there. They'll tell you what, what I'm talking about. And. Uh, need to get yourself regimented on a situation with your food. Also exercise. Now in my case I can't walk very far. You know, I'm doing good to walk uh, a block. But I do um, upper body stuff because uh, we people with the losses of limbs uh, have to use your hands for all kinds of stuff. So that's just a little bit, and I'm gonna give you all some of my cards. And um, I welcome anybody to call me. I don't care if it's seven o'clock in the morning, seven at night, three in the morning. Just don't call me drunk. You know, and I'm, I'm not being smart. But <laughs> Sir, we're gonna go to Q and A right now because these people are going home, and you're gonna be still here talking. So get relaxed. I'm, I'm relaxed, and I was finishing up. So. Good. Uh, are there any questions you have? We're talking about adjustments. That was our initial thing. This man has gone through a lot of adjustments mentally, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and physically, and in his marriage and everything else. And you can tell that by his presentation. So you might want to have some specific questions you want to ask him. Because this man has learned to cope. And coping skills are the things that really help us to survive anything, any challenge that we have in life. You know, there's, there's seven steps to solving a problem. We're not going to go through right now. We can list them all for you. But do you have any questions for both? Yeah, go ahead. Just what is your favorite vegetable now? Because I know you have to eat vegetables. What's your favorite? Well, I'm going to tell you what my favorite vegetable was and how I overcome it. French fries. <laughs> no, they're not a vegetable. No, it's got to be a cup. No. <laughs> Listen. I, I take on this whole room for a French fry. I know. Mm -hmm. So, good. if you take, um, what's those green things? Uh, Asparagus. No, Asparagus. Long. Asparagus. Zucchini. 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 All right, and you you bread it and put milk <coughs> on it just like you would a uh, uh, onion ring or something, and uh, you deep fry that. I know. You put it in the oven, and I put <coughs> just a hair of olive oil on on the uh, thing you put it on, on Great Chef on it, and uh, pan you put it in, okay? And you cut them where they look like french fries, and I can guarantee you they are delicious. So you bread them? See, I would not bread them. Well, you, don't, you don't have to. No, there's olive oil, salt and pepper, make yeah. them look like french fries, because that right there to your brain, that just shows you, yeah, we can have yeah, this. Yeah, but you know what, I never thought, and I, I, I'm not talking about it, really, 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 really light bread. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you could do 200 of these things with what most people would do with, say, onion rings, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, those things are delicious, and I don't even like it to start with, except for eating bread. We might be able to put egg and pork rinds in bread, huh? Yeah, everybody's different. Yeah, yeah. and every every yeah. patient is going to be different. Yeah. But every situation. Um, that was potatoes. 
I was raised on a farm in Tennessee, and we worked hard, you know? Uh, and potatoes was a mainstay, meat and potatoes. And man, when you took those things away from me, I, I love fried potatoes. Well, I haven't figured out quite yet how to get those. But if you, uh, if you like, if you happen to like fries, this is a marvelous way to do it, you know? So has it changed? Have you changed your eating a whole lot since all this? Have you really? I lost ninety-four pounds. And you're eating. So that's great. And you're doing um, more healthier choices. Absolutely. And are you on are, medica are you on medications or yes, I am. insulin yes, or I am. insulin? Uh, I went though from one hundred and eighty units a day to twenty-five. Wow, that's great. So, yeah. um, you don't need forty, right? The doctors say. Your, your pancreas only gives you 40 a day is all you need. Well, that's not necessarily true because everybody's going to have to say well, Everybody's different, I know that. You know, so so I won't go there because that's a medical issue. And insulins are different too. So. And insulins are different. Do you feel better? Do you feel a lot better now? Oh my God, yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I, I feel happier too. Yeah. You know, and... Um, Getting up and down, and everything that big belly I, that I still got, but I, it's a, a lot less. But uh, I feel great, I, and I'm trying to eat the right things. My wife uh, makes desserts that there's no sugar, no anything, and they're good, you know. Of course, now to somebody that is eats gourmet desserts all the time, not even really good. But if you to just to have an opportunity to have something that tastes good to you that don't hurt you. That's not as they say that ain't all bad, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? I got a dog. <laughs> no other questions? Miss Cindy, you got anything or you want to add anything? Well, I just want to thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I, I'll just briefly Another God thing happened, and that's how I met Mo. When he was in the hospital, one of the men that goes to our church was a chaplain there. Yeah, and he went in, and there's a whole story behind oh, that, sure. because he told Milt he didn't want a chaplain. But anyhow, and God put Milt back in the room, and they started talking music, which Milt is a musician, and spent almost the whole day together, right? Yeah. So I don't even know when he came to our church, but I volunteered to go through our church list and update it with birthdays and anniversaries. And I happened to call Mo, I think it was in February or January of last year. And he said, oh, honey, I don't go to your church, but I do this thing where I talk to people that are struggling with <clears throat> diabetes. And I went, well, I teach a healthy food class. <laughs> so I invited him, and I think this is your third time here. Yeah. And I just... Um, Mo brought his CDs, and this is not to sell things here, because we do not do that for those that are regular. But I, I just thought it would be wonderful to have this for $10, and he signs them. And so I put them out today because I thought, we're always looking for a little stocking stuffer, something that we can give that's special. And how neat would that be to, to let someone have something that somebody made um, with the stories that he's got and it's more personal and he will sign them for you and also um i told those that are normally in the class i did get jody can you hold those little stevia things up i did order those those are 9.99 or higher in the store and so if anybody wants those those are the little stevia pellets which are uh, the sweet leaf stevia that you can keep in your purse or pocket and um so Kristen. We ordered them, and you can get those today for $7. So, um, you know, for those that need them, there's 100 pellets in there. So we wanted to do that as a service to you guys. But I just really thank Mo. And anyone else have a question? I just love the way God works, that he brings, you know, he knew that we'd all be in this room today, and he knew that this is a divine appointment. And, you know, when you hear testimonies from people, and you see how you can change your life, um, that's encouraging. And it is a struggle. And we're all in it together, so everyone's always welcome to come here on Thursdays at 2. And we share ideas and things. Any other questions? One footnote. 
I mentioned my wife earlier, I see the doctors here. They've taken her, she was taking three, four lab rides a day and metformin. Metformin is all gone. She's now on one lab ride per day. And I think that'll be gone soon too. So she's really made leaps and strides. And it's all as a result of your meeting here. Yeah. So we're grateful for that. And all of your all of your health and testimonies support have been phenomenal. Lydia's really gained. You know, I'm not a diabetic, but I'm certainly here to support the group. And anybody else has got other issues too, for that matter. And with this group, you never have to, you're not accountable, you yeah. don't have to weigh, you don't have to come, you don't have to call if you're not coming. My commitment is to be here if there's one or 15, we, um, we're we here every Thursday at 2 o'clock. And um, it's just, you bring your gifts and we all share them together and God is making a difference for us. Cindy, so you had that one month when you had, uh, and we do it probably New Year's, right? Starting again with yes. hot luck, all the oh, yeah. diabetic kind of... Interest. If you want to be on the email list, let me know if you're not. And I email you um, updates. And we had a healthy food potluck oh, uh, a month or October 9th it was. Yes. And it was phenomenal. Everybody brought in different things that they've learned to, to adjust to. And, you know, the nice thing was after we ate that that day... We all remarked, none of us had that full, bloated feeling. It's really nice to be able to enjoy your food and still feel good. So we'll be doing that again starting the first of the year. But anything else anyone can think of? I got a real quick question. You mentioned that you had an enormous battle with alcohol. Yes, sir. And how did you eventually overcome that one? That's quick. You just said, I'm done, never again. Wow. That Matter of fact, um, a few years ago, the last two, two years ago, I guess, I was, I was still smoking. And uh, I was performing, or getting ready to perform in St. Louis. And I uh, had a heart attack, mild one. Uh, but anyway, they took me to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital in the ambulance, I told the guy there with me, I says, uh, I just opened up a pack with Winston White one of I says, here, I, I'm quitting smoking. I give these to you. And I says, here's my lighter. I says, now if you smoke, you can have them. If you don't, get them to the front. If you don't, throw them away. I don't care. So we get to the hospital. They take me into the emergency room, and they're going, you know how they're checking out and everything. And the doctor said, he's cool. He says, you're a nurse. I said, I don't drink anymore. I said, I used to. I said I wouldn't consider myself an alcoholic because it didn't go to the meat, you know, so, um, <laughs> but uh, I says I haven't had a drink in a long time except for a little occasional glass of wine. And he says, well, how about smoking? Do you uh, still smoke? No, sir. No, I don't smoke or I quit. He says, you did? I said, yes, sir. He says, well, now, when did you quit smoking? I said, about 20 minutes ago. <laughs>